Turn on your light, and they'll see you. You make a sound, and they'll hear you. If you think it's scary being lost, Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are going back to Silent Hill 3. And ladies and gentlemen, I was first introduced to Silent Hill with Silent Hill 2, and that game just sunk me down emotionally to a level I did not know a game could possibly do. I'll always remember that feeling of the credits rolling and the emotion I was experiencing during that final message the game sends you off with. Every game apparently needs to end in a happy way. And I was so relieved to finally play a game in Silent Hill 2 that understood the mission that games are an art form and they don't always have to leave you in an uplifted area. Silent Hill 2 begged me to think and it made me think about a lot with its many deep themes across its main story. So naturally, it made a series fan out of me then and there. But then it was time to explore more. As we approached the release of Silent Hill 2 Remake, I had to see what's going on with the rest of this series. And naturally, don't worry, I played this in the original way, like you see behind me here, except this is Silent Hill 2. So I did not play it through the HD collection, so don't worry at all. But I'm very excited to talk about Silent Hill 3, because there's much to get into today. This is a very different story in more ways than one than Silent Hill 2. And yes, before we go any further, I didn't play Silent Hill 1 first. I played Silent Hill 2, then 3, and now I guess I'm about to go back to 1 as we'll talk about it, ladies and gentlemen. As always with these first time playthroughs, I am going to be spoiling the entirety of the main story. So if you plan on playing this game yourself, feel free to tab off and watch later, but I am going to go deep into this game. And for those of you excited for Silent Hill 2, don't worry, this doesn't spoil anything when it comes to that game at all, because the way Silent Hill works, I guess they just ping pong back and forth. But I don't know. Anyway, welcome to Retro Rebound. If you're new here and you're into nostalgic and retrospective content, consider subscribing and fret not, we will be talking about Silent Hill 2 a little bit later into the early days of October. So like I mentioned earlier, Silent Hill is art to me, especially when it comes to the story. And always with art, it's about what does it leave you with when you finish? And the feelings I was left with Silent Hill 3 were much different than that of 2. But that's how I analyze these games. What's the exiting emotion? And this was the thought. Silent Hill 3 is probably the most violent video game I have ever played without the actual definition typically being used for games like Doom or Halo or Space Marine 2. Silent Hill 3 is violent on a whole other level. I played this game and beat it in close to nine hours across four sessions, most of those ranging in two to three hour bursts. And after every single session of Silent Hill 3 was complete, I was exhausted when the reality was I wasn't playing for a really long time. And in the scheme of things, you hear that a game is under 10 hours and you go, wow, pretty short game. But Silent Hill 3 felt way longer than two, which two is like a complete vibe. Three though is violent in every sense. It's music pretty much assaults you where it's either silent and you're left to your thoughts or it's very metallic crunchy or gooey. It's always deeply unsettling when an enemy attacks you and you don't even hear music necessarily. It's just an orchestra of a ton of different sounds happening at once. It's deeply confusing. It's, I guess, maybe a representation of what you'd feel if you were actually being attacked by a monster and just your thoughts and the chaos and everything is happening around you. But it's the music, it's the environments, which are absolutely beautiful for a PS2 game in particular when it comes to the character models, but you're always lost and confused and the environments, especially in the other world, are dirty and damaged and bloody. And even when you're not really in the other world, it's not necessarily uplifting. And then you're also as a main character, powerless and overwhelmed. You're not strong in combat at all, at least until the very end where you have a katana and SMG to do something about it. But for the most part, you are powerless in Silent Hill. And that's always been by design. I think there are fair critiques as we'll talk about later with the gameplay when it comes to camera angles and how it works for and against the series. But by design, this series wants you to feel powerless and Silent Hill 3 is a perfect example of why. Because that vulnerability combined with the music, combined with the environments, 
it all creates a very violent feeling experience where you're clenching and you're tense until you don't even realize you're feeling that way anymore until you stop playing and you just exhale and go, what did I just get myself into? And because it is relentlessly violent, because everything is so continuously unsettling, it is far more scary than any video game I played, but for all the reasons that I don't think people expect out of a scary game. Nowadays, scary games are defined by the jump scare. And very few understand true tension within horror. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking down on games like Dead Space or Resident Evil, or if you want an obscure example here, Paranormosite, The Seven Mysteries of Hanjo, where that game really hinges a lot of its fear factor on can you tolerate blindly turning around and likely having an enemy right in your face? Can you handle that? So a lot of games do prey on the jump scare and they're effective in their own way. But Silent Hill 3 is in a league of its own where it gradually just whittles away your stamina. Where eventually, like an hour in, I'm locking the door behind me. I'm just making sure like, okay, I'm safe and secure. Like I can handle this game. And that intensity just gradually builds more and more because it's so violent continuously. I'm always so unsettled playing it. And that's definitely enhanced by the game's visuals, which we'll get into with one particular shot in the storeroom that will stick with me forever. I, I wish I didn't see it, it was terrifying. But let's talk about the story here. Again, spoiler mode on. So this is a direct continuation of Silent Hill 1. You are the daughter of the series' first protagonist in Henry Mason, her name being Heather Mason. And 17 years ago, Harry managed to stop the order and basically they are back. Now, Harry eventually pays the ultimate price in Silent Hill 3 for what he did all that time ago. And it is during one of the best stretches of the game, but we'll get to that. Thematically, that's always the question with Silent Hill. And I want to urge everyone to understand here that I think we all walk away with different understandings of the art that we consume. So maybe you walk away with a different understanding of Silent Hill 3, and I'm keen to hear about it down below. But here's what I was really thinking. It's on two levels. First and foremost, it's a game about religion and sort of the dominance it holds over a lot of people in many ways. And you realize that as you go deeper and deeper into the game. I mean, you really first get that feeling when you encounter Claudia Wolf, who is the high priestess of the order. I mean, the final stretch of the game is set in a church after all. But anyway, the order is seeking out Heather because she is needed to bring back God, who can then usher in a new paradise where basically they're trying to make a world without pain. And a lot of this is about coping through religion, if you will. Many of us do it, I've done it in the past, but. It's also an unhealthy coping of religion of like, we need God so badly to remove all pain, all negatives in this world. And for many, that's just not really a realistic expectation of what the world can become. And if that's even a good world or just a world that's convenient for people like Claudia. Now, the reason they need Heather is because Heather is a reincarnation of Alessa, who is from the first game and had the seed of God in her. Now, Alessa is also part of the reason that Harry had to die because according to Claudia, she lost Heather slash Alessa. And so now Harry has to pay the price. Now, this is mostly coming to a head with the memory of Alessa boss fight on the carousel toward the end of the game. It is also one of the creepiest visuals in a game I've experienced. And after beating her, she actually leaves a message in blood on the ground. For me, one of the scariest types of horror is religious style horror, for me at least personally. I think it's just visuals I saw growing up across movies and shows and the occasional very rare game that always deeply unsettled me. I think of games like Fear 3, which I know isn't the scariest game, but you have this little girl with long black hair draped over her face, just a white gown. That stuff always freaks me out, whereas I can handle horror in like monsters and killing monsters like a dead space all day long or resident evil all day long those are manageable for me but when it comes to a religious style of horror it really just gets under my skin big time so this game also by the way does target a particular horror weakness of mine but in that same vein of the little girl from fear 3 is also what happens to heather in one particular spot of the game where you are standing in the storeroom you're looking at this mirror and you see yourself on the other side and that side of the room begins to transform and outside of the initial sounds all you start to hear is like gurgling as the image on the other side of the mirror begins to transform into a bloodied burned heather and it's incredibly creepy like i sat there for a minute and was like hell no i'm getting out of here i don't need to look at this any longer dude like that was terrifying to me it was so unsettling and the best thing i can say about that 
is it's proof that you really don't need jump scares to make your game scary. That is the best thing Silent Hill 3 does. There is really one jump scare toward the end of the game. You're in the haunted house. I think a body drops down in front of you. And that got me pretty good because the game is so deprived of jump scares that I'm not expecting it. And then they hit me with that. I'm like, really? You just had to twist the knife while it was in me at this point. But my God, that visual will hang with me. And then fighting her was even worse than like just staring her down the whole time. There's no running away. I got to kill the memory of Alessa. I mentioned at the top of this though, thematically, I feel the game is about two things based on my interpretation. So one was about religion and what it does to individuals. The other was about life as a woman and the expectations that are set upon them. More than anything, it spoke to, I think, a level of agency with a woman's body, which I was very surprised to find in a 2003 video game. So continuing on here, God is living inside Heather and she is the one that has to give birth to said God. It's a forced pregnancy that she has literally no choice in. And then it even points to the baby really kicking when Heather begins to suddenly drop in pain and writhe. And you see Claudia mention like God is growing within you. That again, indicating that Heather is pregnant with this God in her. And at the end, when Heather was just about to get ready to give birth to God, she takes a medicine from the pendant that she's had from the start of the game and vomits God onto the floor before stomping him out on the ground. And again, with a series so much built upon its themes and its subliminal messaging, you have to look at every single action as a message and Heather spitting out and stepping on God is very much a no thank you to religion from her and the expectations set upon her. And I also think the message is, to me at least, that women are expected to give birth even at the cost of themselves. I think that message holds especially strong nowadays. Now, for a lack of a better term, based on the violence I spoke about earlier, it's also about an environment around her oppressing her in every sense, but she is fighting back actively against it. Now, there are elements that I found particularly off with the tone of the game, and I think it's deliberate, and I think I understand it, and it's in the final line of the ending I got where Heather says, don't you think blondes have more fun? When that first happened, you gotta look at it from my point of view. Silent Hill 2, I'll just say, ends with one of the most gut-wrenching, depressing messages ever in a credit scene. And you go from that to, don't you think blondes have more fun? Credits. And I'm like, what was that, man? Wait, what? Like, why are we all uplifted? That was horrible what just happened there. But as I beat the game months ago, took some time to think about it, you start to understand that right before that, as I was going through the footage to prepare for this video, you have Heather saying, call me Cheryl, right? She's taking her name back. She's taking her identity back, who she is, and she kind of lightens up a little bit. And you wonder if like, is that the real Heather who's been kind of hiding herself away throughout this entire game? And now she is able to overcome these expectations set upon her. And this is the real Heather or Cheryl, if you will. And that was particularly powerful as well. So I feel like I came away with a pretty solid understanding of the game. As for the side characters that surrounded it, characters like Douglas, I could not stand this dude's voice actor, no offense. Uh, characters like Vincent, I thought had kind of a weak death. Like I thought the overall support cast wasn't as interesting, but I give it this caveat. I haven't really played Silent Hill 1. I only researched Silent Hill 1 to make sure I fully understood what I was talking about with Silent Hill 3. And what's pretty great is the overall message and what the game left me with was based solely in Silent Hill 3. It had very little to do with the continuation of Silent Hill 1. But that sort of context of like who Alessa is, that stuff that upon reading further, I'll completely admit, I went, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense what was happening there. And that's why my initial understanding was religion and then the deeper understanding with Alessa and everything was like, oh, expectations set upon women. So that's kind of my thoughts on the story and the themes there. Overall, I thought it was excellent and it was an exhausting playthrough despite how short it was, but it was a very memorable playthrough. If I were to scale it against Silent Hill 2, I do think Silent Hill 2 still takes the cake with the way its characters just worked so beautifully for me. And I just remember every single moment of that game, it feels like so painfully clearly because Everything was done so deliberately well. And not that Silent Hill 3 doesn't have that, but I do think different messages resonate with different individuals. And I think Silent Hill 2's messaging just resonated with me a little bit more. But I do think Silent Hill 3's storytelling and thematic messaging was handled a lot more intelligently, is what I would say. And that Silent Hill 2 definitely has the ability to rest upon its vibes and its character interactions more. And part of the experience that I loved with Silent Hill 2 was running into characters more and having those encounters, where Silent Hill 3, by default, 
does not want you to have those encounters often because of the nature of the themes of the game. Violence, oppression, that sort of thing. And speaking of violence, let's talk about the gameplay, shall we? So I love the camera angles in Silent Hill. I don't know if that's a hot take nowadays, but I love that they have fixed camera angles. I think it works remarkably well for the franchise because it gets to set up shots like in the haunted house where you do see lightning flash and you have a silhouette of a body hanging from a tree and then it goes away quickly and you have the ability as a developer to just set up these angles set up these shots create claustrophobia or discomfort within your player in any given room the problem naturally being is controls because in that same example i gave a positive there's also a negative as i'm escaping this haunted house i'm making a bunch of wrong turns i die a bunch of times i have to reload my save a bunch of times and it's kind of frustrating it's very old school in that way but i also feel like i'm starting to slowly become a defender of the silent hill control scheme and how it plays and how it functions i don't know if it'll be set in stone with the silent hill 2 remake we'll have to see when that time comes but for me, I do like the kind of cumbersome nature of the controls because a lot of this series is built upon being lost and confused and kind of figuring things out. And it's not naturally coming to you like if I were playing Dead Space versus playing Silent Hill. Again, it's all about the themes. And if you're like a theme junkie, that's what Silent Hill is all about. So I would still love the camera angles as a second go around here. I'll also throw out there though that the map navigation is kind of eh still. I was always popping open the map, seeing where my arrow was facing, reorienting myself, popping it open again. I was doing this constantly. Same thing with navigating my inventory. It's just a lot of pause and go, pause and go. A little too much. And I think for a game so thematically driven, I wish its menus were a little more in world, if you will, something that we've brought up Dead Space a lot. I think they do really well. Also critiques that remain from Silent Hill 2, puzzles. Uh, I, I know that's really hit or miss for people. For me, like the randomized puzzle solutions it can really kill the vibe for me when I just get stuck on one of these. And if I did want to look up a walkthrough, I can't. I know for some people it's part of the fun. It's part of just the confusion and being lost. I like a good puzzle in games, but for me, the brain busters in these, and some of them are ridiculous. Like one was like mixing in chemicals and putting it in a trash bucket and taking that trash bucket to a fan. And maybe for some people they're like, duh, obviously, but I never really felt that way almost ever. And there were even times where I had the solution right, but I was just slightly putting it in wrong, like with the first puzzle involving the books and what order you put them up in. I don't know, man. It was just at times a little too brain busty for me, particularly in this game. And I never really enjoyed Silent Hill for its puzzles. It's kind of the part of my experience that I just, you know, wipe away and blur out. But it's also the part of my experience that when I'm telling people how much I love Silent Hill, I always forget to remind them, by the way, uh, yeah, the, the, the puzzles are not gonna do too much for you. However, the weapons are more fun in this game because I think part of the game is like reclaiming yourself, your power. So by the late game, if you've hunted around enough, you have an SMG, you have a katana, <laughs> like you do massive damage. And by the final fight of the game, you utilize all those resources and I was getting knocked on my butt constantly, but you do get an opportunity here to really experience a bit of a power curve in Silent Hill, which is kind of rare. So yeah, overall, it was a really unique experience. And that's what I love about this series. I don't walk away loving every single thing about it, but I also can sit here and confidently say there's nothing like Silent Hill at all. And that's why it's rising up that totem pole of favorite survival horror series because it does a lot wrong in particular with its gameplay, I think. But my God, it's storytelling, it's intelligence, it's just the way it's built and designed is so incredible. There's nothing quite like it. And so I'm excited to go back to Silent Hill 1 probably would make the most sense. And I've heard that Silent Hill 4 is like a continuation of 2. So I, I don't know what to do at this point, but I'm playing the series way out of order. And at some point it's going to necessitate a whole run through. But nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, these are my thoughts on Silent Hill 3. What do you think of the conclusions I came to? Was there anything I overlooked? That's always possible with these kind of very comprehensive narrative deep dives. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So fire away on your thoughts of the experience of Silent Hill 3. But until then, take great care of yourselves and I'll catch you in the next Retro Rebound. Peace out.